family we should be live it is great to be with you guys tonight family as always if you can hear me in the chat uh give me a thumbs up in the live chat right now that way i know things are working and it is great to be together with the body of christ tonight and i uh, appreciate you guys being here with us thank you Kristen and clarinda uh, for the thumbs up and guys i'm sorry i I'm running a tad late, so I was going to be on about 30 minutes earlier, but had to finish up my notes and things like that. So we're just now getting rolling, and it's uh, 9 p.m. Wednesday, March 27th. So, okay, let's get right into it. Um, tonight, obviously, I've titled this video uh, in the form of a question, uh, Coming Judgment on America? Question mark. And many people are understandably uh, looking at these two great American solar eclipses of 2017 and 2024 and wondering if they might be a sign from God. And could it be a warning to America of coming judgment? That's what is on a lot of people's minds. A lot of people are wondering that. And I just want to make this very clear tonight. My goal is not to prove that this is a sign from God and, or that it's not a sign from God. My goal is not to prove either one of those things tonight, because I will tell you right now, I do not know. In short, no one really knows but God, but God. And we can all rest and be at peace in the knowledge that God is sovereign and he is in control. So, so we can all be at peace. That's really all we need to know. That is sufficient. The Lord says, my grace is sufficient. And praise God for that. It is so true. Um, my goal also is that tonight we consider, we just consider all these things thoughtfully. We look to the Bible and we take all of this to the Lord in prayer. And we seek the Holy Spirit's guidance. He is the good shepherd. He is our shepherd. Not any man, but Jesus Christ. He is our shepherd. I want to read a couple verses here. Proverbs 18, 15. The heart of the prudent getteth knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeketh knowledge. Daniel 2, 21 and 22. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. Praise God. So, let's start off our conversation tonight regarding these things with some biblical foundation, because I think that's always the best place to start. So let's start by looking at scripture for some biblical foundation. Did you know the sun and moon are referred to in Genesis chapter one, but they are not named. They are not named. They're referred to, but they're not named. So let's take a look at that. Genesis 1, 14 through 19. We're going to read that. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. 
And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So that was Genesis 1, 14 through 19. So one thing I want to point out about that section of scripture that we just read is how God specifically says this about the lights in the firmament, the lights that he put in the sky. It says, let them be for signs, seasons, days, and years. So let's look at those words in the Hebrew really quick. That word signs, which is the first thing listed as what these lights are to be used for, uh, that is the Hebrew word oath. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's oath, which is Strong's H226. And it means a signal as a flag, beacon, beacon, monument, omen, prodigy, evidence, mark, miracle, sign, token. Okay, so that's what the word oath means in Hebrew, which is interesting that that's the first thing that these lights are listed to be for. Um, the second word is seasons. That's what we read in English. The Hebrew is moed, moed, which is Strong's H4150. And this word means appointed. It means assembly, congregation, feast, season, solemn, synagogue, set time, appointed time. And so there's what's very interesting about this word moed is you might have heard of the seven feasts of God. Um, these are all moed. So we have Passover, um, you have unleavened bread, first fruits, then you have Shavuot or, or Feast of Weeks, then you have uh, Feast of Trumpets, then you have Day of Atonement, and then you have, sorry, Feast of Trumpets, yeah, Day of Atonement, then Feast of Tabernacles, also called Sukkot. Those are the seven feasts or Moed, that word feasts is the same, same word as seasons. Feast and seasons in English are both the same Hebrew word, Moed. And these were all obviously very special appointed times for God to do something incredible in relation to or dealing with mankind. We know that Jesus was died, buried, and resurrected on Passover, unleavened bread, and, and first fruits. So these are things that God has appointed times with men. And it's interesting that this is the second reason that the Bible lists right off the bat for the lights in the heavens, for the sun, moon, and stars. Um, and then, of course, the next two words were days and years, which are pretty self-explanatory. They mean days and years. So right from the beginning of the Bible, we see that God can and will use the lights in the firmament, which is to include stars, planets, the sun, and the moon, for signs and appointed times. Let's read Psalm 19, 1 through 2, because I always think of this verse when we're talking about these things. It says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. Showeth knowledge. That's really, really an incredible verse. And so let's think about these things. We can, we can also look at scripture, and we can also think of when God used a star alignment of, of some sort to notify the wise men of the birth of Jesus Christ and also to guide them to where he was. That's a very significant sign that God spoke through to men using the lights in the firmament. We also have the moment of Jesus' crucifixion on the cross, 
when the sun was darkened for three hours, which was clearly a sign to the world. Again, using the sun as a sign to the world. And let's read about that in Luke 23, 45 through 47. It says, the sun was darkened and the veil, and the speaking of the moment of crucifixion, the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now, when the centurion saw what was done, the sun being darkened for three hours, Jesus crying out on the cross, giving up his spirit. When the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. So clearly this was a sign that was used to speak to mankind. Uh, let's read Genesis. Uh, sorry. I mean, okay. Let me mention this because this is really, really interesting. Did you know the first reference in the entire Bible of the word moon? Because remember in Genesis 1, it's referred to, but it's not named. The first reference in the entire Bible of the actual word moon is in Genesis chapter 37. Also in Genesis, chap Genesis chapter 37, and in the same verse, is the very first reference of the words sun and moon together being used in the entire Bible. And this is very interesting. That verse is about them being used as a sign in a prophetic dream. I think that's very interesting that the very first use of the words sun and moon together is as a sign in a prophetic dream. And you can read about that in Genesis 37, verse 9. It says, Then he, which is speaking of Joseph, dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. So that is the very first time in Scripture the words sun and moon are used together, and it's the very first Scripture that the word moon is used. So I find it worth noting that not only does Genesis 1 state that the sun and moon will be used for signs and moaids, but also the very first mention of them by name um, as both the sun and moon being used together is in a is as a sign in a prophetic dream. So take that for what it's worth. Um, I think it's worth noting so now let's let's look a little bit here at scripture also as far as let's get some biblical precedents is god in the habit of warning prior to judgment is that in within the character of the lord because we're kind of again we're trying to lay some foundation and understand how god operates and what the scriptures say. And so is God in the habit of warning prior to judgment? Well, let's read uh, Amos 3, 6 through 7. It says, Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it? Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. So right there we see Speaking of coming judgment, impending doom, God says that he always speaks first. He always reveals it first. That's really interesting. That's worth noting. So we have numerous examples of God warning people of coming judgment in the scriptures, uh, both in the Old Testament via the prophets and also in the New Testament where we have Jesus and the apostles warning of the coming day of the Lord and the judgment that all will face after death. So we can we can think about these things. We can look at scripture. We can see that uh, we, we can think of Jeremiah, where God sent Jeremiah to warn and to speak to Israel and tell Israel to repent 
and that if they wouldn't repent, that they would be uh, taken into captivity by their enemies and taken into Babylon. We can also think of Jonah, the prophet Jonah, um, being sent to Nineveh and to warn the Ninevites. And so let's let's read a, a scripture about that. Jonah 3, verse 1 through 3 says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And it continues on from there and says that he goes and says, Repent, for 40 days from now the Lord will judge Nineveh if you don't repent. So this is interesting because here we are seeing God warning a Gentile nation. God speaking first prior to judgment and warning a Gentile nation. Nineveh was not a Jewish nation. Jonah did not Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh because they were the enemy of the Jews. But God still in his great mercy and in his great love chose to speak first prior to the coming judgment and warn of the coming judgment. And so that's really worth noting. And um, here is something that I find interesting, and I've heard many people mention, so I just wanted to mention it. Uh, archaeological scholar Donald Wiseman, a former curator at the British Museum and leading expert on Assyrian culture, has speculated that a solar eclipse did occur over Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And there are also others who um, study this kind of Thing, study this particular thing, I guess, that say that around the time of Jonah going to Nineveh, there was a total solar eclipse and also an earthquake in that region around that time. Again, I don't think anyone is absolutely certain or can claim with certainty that it was right at the time of Jonah or right before the time of Jonah, but it's generally thought by some who study this that a total, total solar eclipse and an earthquake did happen in that area around the time of Jonah preaching to Nineveh. So take that for what it's worth. Maybe take it with a grain of salt. I can't vet it. I can't prove it. But it is something that's brought up. So I was going to mention it. And um, those who have studied that and looked into that have postulated and wondered whether or not God had used those things to kind of, you know, work the ground, till the ground, kind of stir up the Ninevites and get them you know, looking around, kind of looking for answers to um, to get them prepared for the message of Jonah. It's a possibility. I, I do not know. I can't claim to know there. Uh, I'm not sure, but I find it in interesting nonetheless. So let's do a short recap before we get into some, um, I guess, some really interesting details and particulars regarding this upcoming eclipse of um, April 8th, 2024. So short recap, we see clearly that the Lord can, and I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying very, very specifically here. The Lord can use the heavens to speak. The Lord has used the heavens to speak. The Lord is in the habit or it is in the Lord's character to speak to nations prior to coming judgment. That is within the Lord's character. And um, so we clearly see that the Lord can use the heavens to speak. And some, unfortunately, are so presumptuous out there as to declare how the Lord, the Lord, is allowed to use the heavens to speak. and. I would just say I'm settled by simply seeing that the Lord can use the heavens to speak. And I'm not going to presume as to tell the Lord how he's allowed to use the heavens to speak or when he's allowed to use the heavens to speak. Um, I'll just choose to leave it up to our creator, God, to determine how he chooses to do so. 
because I'm a man. We're men and he is God. Amen. So remember this too, with that in mind, first Corinthians one 27, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. All right. So I wanted to show you guys, I put a poll up on my uh, YouTube community page because I just wanted to see uh, what you guys were thinking and kind of what was in on your heart regarding this topic. So let me bring up this the poll results here and we'll see what they are. Okay, so this was the poll I put up. It says, do you believe the two great American solar eclipses of 2017 and 2024 are prophetically significant? And we had about 3,500 votes. So that's a good amount of people. And 72% said yes. <clears throat> Seven excuse me, 7% said no. And 21% said maybe. So... 93% of people here are either yes or it's possible, uh, and 7% said no. So that's interesting, and this is something I want you guys to know. I really appreciate your feedback. I really appreciate hearing from you because I just want you to know I'm not special. I am no one to be held up. Um, I want you to take everyone's word to scripture take it to the lord look to the holy spirit as your guide and not to men test everything with scripture but i want you to know i really appreciate hearing from you because the holy spirit is the shepherd of the flock god is the one who leads and speaks to the church i, I think about what um jesus said over and over in the book of revelation he said he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so I really appreciate getting a poll um, information back from you guys. And I find it interesting that 93% of you say uh, yes or maybe, and 7% say no. So I really appreciate hearing from you guys on this topic, and, and thank you for it. Um, so now let's, let's get into talking about the eclipses and let's get into just considering some very interesting things because again i do not know if this is a sign and my goal tonight is not to prove whether it is a sign or it's not a sign the goal is to just consider these things thoughtfully um look at the scriptures and then go and i just encourage all of you to take all of this to the lord on your own and see how the lord would speak to you and guide you okay so let's talk about these great american solar eclipses now are they a sign from god are they not again i don't know um, but let's look to the lord first let's talk about the 2017 great american solar eclipse the one that happened back in 2017 and let me bring up a map that shows these eclipses here let me put this on the screen for you guys all right, there we go. So that is the 2017 eclipse. It is also, it shows the upcoming uh, April 8th, 2024 eclipse. And it also shows the annular eclipse of October 14th, 2023. And I want to read, we're going to focus on the 2017 eclipse first here, okay? Uh, being the first one of the of the set. That's the upper one that goes from left down to right. And I want to read to you something from timeanddate.com. It says, before the eclipse in August 2017, the last time a total solar eclipse was visible from coast to coast was almost 100 years earlier on June 8th of 1918. So that's pretty interesting. And it continues on and says, what made this eclipse extra special is that it was the first time since the total eclipse of January 11th, 1880, so even earlier, 
that a total solar eclipse occurred exclusively over the continental United States. No other country saw totality. Though many countries saw a partial eclipse of the sun, no other country saw totality. So this is why this eclipse was also called the Great American Eclipse. And that's, I find that pretty interesting. Let me make myself a little bit bigger here. That's pretty interesting. Um, also, here's something worth noting. Uh, let's see here. Oh, okay, yeah, let's look at this. This says, this is also from, I think, uh, greatamericansolareclipse.com. It says only about eight total eclipses have crossed the entire United States since we became a nation in 1776. I think that's where I got this. Anyway, I looked at a picture to see whether or not that was true, and it looks about right. Only about eight total eclipses have crossed the entire United States, or at least most of the United States, since we became a nation in 1776. And only one of those eclipses touched the United States uh, and no other country. And that was the eclipse seven years ago in 2017, it seems. Um, at least, let's see here. I don't know if that jives with that earlier statement there. Again, I'm looking at uh, websites, not doing this research myself. I'm not an expert on eclipses. I don't have the historical logs for these things. But some say that, you know, either way you look at it, it's been a long time since an eclipse only touched America. And so at least from 1880, till 2017. So that was one thing, at least, that drew a lot of attention to the 2017 solar eclipse and made it a very unique thing. So there was kind of some very significant uh, historical, you know, aspects to that 2017 solar eclipse that we saw. Now, let's move on to the 2024 e uh, eclipse that's coming up here on April 8th. And this is, this is very interesting. Let me show you something here. Let me take down this slide. And let's go to, I've got another picture that I want to show you. Because they're saying that it, this might be the biggest travel event in American history, this upcoming April 8th, 2024 eclipse. And let me show you this. This was from... I think the same website. Let's see. Yeah, greatamericaneclipse.com. And so this is interesting. Well, let's read this. It says about the 2024 upcoming eclipse. Anticipation of the for the April 8th, 2024 total eclipse will be sky high. Not only are there 32 million people already living within the USA section of the path, but the metropolitan areas such as St. Louis, Cincinnati, Detroit, Toronto, and Quebec are very close to the path. The major cities of Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C. are all within 200 miles of the path of totality. So be prepared for the single biggest mass travel event in the USA. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. The single biggest mass travel event in the USA. And I did a little bit of, uh, more research and, and looking around on the internet regarding that. And I found this website. So I wanted to share this with you real quick and just read this because I thought this was was interesting. Um, it's from aerotime.aero and it says, or aerotime hub. Anyway, it says US airlines expect April solar eclipse to be the biggest travel event in history. That's pretty wild. Um, it says, let's see here. It says US-based airlines are busy preparing for what is expected to be the busiest ever period for air travel in the country in its history. Areas of North America are due to be treated to spectacular views of a total solar eclipse occurring in April, 2024. So that that's worth noting. That's pretty interesting to me. Um, I was surprised to find that out. So here's just, let's stop real quick. And here's just an interesting thought here. And this is just speculation. This is just thinking out loud. But let's just consider for a moment, if God 
was wanting to speak specifically to America and use the heavens to do so. This certainly would at least seem to be a, bear, a very big event, which a lot of Americans will see. In fact, you know, as we just read, they're saying this is expected to be the largest travel event in American history and that 32 million people already live in the path and they're expecting millions and millions and millions and millions of people, the biggest ever in history, to travel to the path of totality to see it. That's interesting. That's worth considering. And it's at least uh, thought provoking, if you want to put it that way. And another thing it said, a solar eclipse won't pass over a large part of America again until 2044. So I thought that was worth mentioning as well. All right, let, here's another thing I want to show you guys. And again, I'm not going to be able to cover every single thing tonight. I'm sure there's going to be some things that I don't bring up that you uh, find interesting. And if there is something that I don't bring up and you want to mention or point out, put it below in the comments. But here's something else I want to show you. Let me pull up another picture here. Where is this one? There's a plant. Yeah, here it is. Let's look at this because this is this is interesting. And I just recently found this out as well. All right. So here's a picture. These are the planets and a comet that are going to be visible in the middle of the day when the eclipse happens. And if I can make it bigger here, what you can see, let me see if I can zoom in on that. Can I zoom in? Yeah. Here we go. Look at that. So that's really interesting. So there you've got the, uh, let me go. There we go. There you've got the, the eclipse happening. You've got Mercury right next to the sun. Over here, you've got this comet called 12P Pons Brooks, which is also referred to as the Devil Comet. And we're going to get into that more in just a second. You have uh, Uranus and Jupiter right here. You have Venus right next to the sun, to the right of the sun. I think that's pretty interesting. You guys know that I think Venus is very significant. Um, there's connotations in the Bible that connect Venus to Jesus and the rapture, which is uh, really interesting. And I did a whole video on that if you want to go look at that. And then we also have Saturn and Mars that are going to be visible. So... I thought that was interesting and, and worth pointing out that those things are going to be visible. If you want to look at those um, during the eclipse when it happens, those things are going to be happening. Uh, here's something as to um, why that comet is called the Devil Comet, because I was wondering that myself. So I found this online, and I'll show you guys. It's from astronomy.com, and it says right here, let me get rid of this. It says right here, the Devil Comet Horns explained. Why is Pond Brooks being called the Devil Comet at all? Well, in late July 2023, the comet underwent an outburst, blowing off a bunch of gas and dust and brightening by about 100 times, jumping overnight from magnitude 17 to magnitude 12. Such, outbor such outbursts are random, unpredictable, and not entirely common. Though researchers have noted that Pons Brooks in particular has exhibited such behavior before and several times per orbit. That outburst caused the comma to distort into a horseshoe or horned shape with a dark center and bright wings or points. Hence, many media outlets nicknamed it the Devil Comet. Um, after the outburst, the comet settled down again and its brightness remained steady until earlier this month when it outburst again, bringing the horns back. <clears throat> Astronomers aren't entirely sure what's causing the horns. And I'll stop right there and say, when it when these folks like NASA and you know stuff say they're not entirely sure, that pretty much means they have no idea. Okay, they have no idea. But it says astron astronomers aren't entirely sure what's causing the horns, but they think it could be due to the comet spewing gas and dust uneven unevenly. Maybe there's one area of the surface that isn't blowing off steam, so to speak, so it remains dark, 
while the other areas to either side of it are bright. Or perhaps it's a shadow effect where denser material or even topography at the center of the comet appears to block some of the bright material behind it from the point of view. Whatever the reason is scientifically interesting because it's intrinsic to the comet and its unique structure, but it's certainly not malicious. Well, I don't know how they can claim to know for sure that it's not malicious, but um, anyway, that's that's what they say that's about this comet and at least why they're calling it the devil comet. And so I, I wanted to look into that and just share that with you guys, because that's what I found out. Um, another thing I want to point out, which I thought was worth being aware of, was this right here. Let me bring up this slide. And this was shared to me by my friend, Lou Vega, who's done some really neat and interesting articles on his website, uh, Postscripts, I believe is his website. Um, about this uh, eclipse. And I have not had the chance to read any of his articles yet, but he sent me this slide and I <clears throat> thought it was a good uh, picture of where the eclipse is happening within the ecliptic, within the constellations. So if you, if you look at this picture here, the eclipse is happening right in the constellation of Pisces, which is the two fish. And there you see, again, you see uh, Mercury, Jupiter, Uranus, Saturn, Mars, and Venus, as we were just showing. And so some people wonder if, if this is significant, that the eclipse is happening in the uh, constellation of Pisces. Again, um, those who have talked about this mention the fish being representation of Christianity, the number 153 of the 153 fish being pulled out. And I thought that was interesting and worth bringing up. So moving on from there, let's get into some more interesting things. So <clears throat> let's, let's bring up the map again of the eclipse patterns that they, that basically the, the eclipse is making it from 2017 to 2023 to 2024. We have a pattern that is being drawn over America. And let me bring up the map again. There we go. <clears throat> okay. So it's been noted already by many people that the two great American solar eclipses form an X over America. It has also been noted that one could even say there's an Aleph and a Tav. So if you look at all three of these, you see the two total, total solar eclipses of 2017 and 2024 and the annular eclipse of October 14th, 2023, they make an Aleph, which is the ancient Hebrew letter Aleph. Uh, and it, it looks very much like an, that a depiction of that letter, all three of the um, eclipses together. Then if you look at just the 2024 and 2017, you see the Tav. I think that's how people are looking at it anyway. So that's something that many people have brought up. Many people are considering. Uh, again, the the Bible talks about, you know, God being the Alpha and the Omega. The Aleph is the um, Alpha, Aleph. So that's, I think that's pretty interesting. I'm not an expert on this stuff. I'm just mentioning this because I've seen people bring it up. I wanted to bring it up so that you can be aware of it and consider these things. However, there also is something, actually quite a few things that are very notable about what's occurring this year in the center of the X from the two total solar eclipses. So where the 2017 and 2024 eclipses merge in the center of that X, there's some very notable things happening this year and some very notable, notable things or noteworthy things about that region of the country that's right there in the middle of that X. So let's talk about that. First of all, uh, I wanted to bring this up. Let's pull this slide up here and you'll see this is something quite noteworthy that is in the middle of the X. And sorry if I'm looking over here a lot, guys. I've got a lot of notes to 
remember things to, to bring up for you guys. So this is right in the middle of that X and that is the New Madrid fault zone. It's right there. So you've got Illinois, Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, Arkansas, Indiana, this area right here where those come together, that's the center of the X. And right there you have the New Madrid fault zone. And so this is somewhere where, you know, people have often thought or postulated if there's another massive earthquake here in this region, it could cause massive damage. And I got this from, I'm going to read this from the Missouri Department of Natural Resources, their government website. And it talks about what they foresee could happen if an earthquake, um, another massive earth earthquake were to happen in that region. They say, this is from their website, due to the nature of the bedrock and the earth's crust in the central United States, Earthquakes in this region can shake an area approximately 20 times larger than earthquakes in California. A magnitude 7.6 earthquake in the New Madrid seismic zone is expected to cause major damage near the fault system in the Missouri Boothiel, I don't know what that word, Boothiel, Northeast Arkansas and Western Kentucky and Tennessee. Oh, maybe it's Boot Hill, Boot Hill. Okay, in the Missouri Boot Hill, <laughs> Northeast Arkansas and Western Kentucky and Tennessee. Significant damage will likely extend north up the Mississippi River Valley to St. Louis, up the Ohio and Wabash River Valleys to near Owensboro, Kentucky and Indianapolis, Indiana and down the Mississippi River Valley to near Greenville, Mississippi. Significant damage is also expected in of Southern Illinois, Western Kentucky and Tennessee, northeastern Arkansas, and northwestern Mississippi, as well as in areas of southwest Missouri outside the Boot Hill. So that's what <clears throat> that government department has to say about what they expect to happen if or when an earthquake occurs in that region. And I find it interesting that that is right in the middle of the X that these um, eclipses are drawing over America. Again, we ask the question, is God using this eclipse X pattern to highlight the New Madrid fault zone? I don't know. You will have to just take that to the Lord yourself. Um, okay, here's another thing I want to bring up now. Let me pull up another slide for you guys because this is really interesting as well. I saw this. Where is this picture? Here we go. I saw this. On Brother Chooch's channel, he was doing a live stream and uh, thought this was really interesting and I wanted to bring it up on my live stream as well. Let me pull this up. Here we go. So in 1981, a 1700 mile crack across America was discovered using modern day gravity mapping. Now, let me make that bigger for you so you guys can see that using modern day gravity mapping satellite data. It is referred to as the Montana to Florida lineament or the Missouri gravity low. This crack seen in blue intersects the New Madrid fault line, which is represented in black. What's interesting is that these fault lines and the path of the great American eclipses that take place on August 21st, 2017, and again on April 8th, 2024 are identical to these two, you know, major fault line cracks in America. And this was only recently discovered in, again, 1981. Also, if you have not seen Bro Chooch's video here, where I'm showing the slide from, uh, it was really, really excellent video. I highly encourage you to go watch it. And I will link this video that he did uh, in my description below and in the chat or in the comments later. But anyway, that to me is really interesting that that the eclipse is identical to those two lines or it basically lines up with those two faults. And I, I find that noteworthy. So let me do, let me drop that slide now out of the way and see what else we have next here to talk about. 
Um, okay, this one is really interesting as well. A another thing that's right there in that center of the X or the middle of the X area. Let me bring this up. Let me show you this map. Is a giant cicada brood. And we'll talk about what that is and where it is. So let me pull this slide. Here we go. So again, same area. You're talking about right there where Illinois, Missouri, Kentucky, Indiana meet up. <clears throat> and this is a map of these huge cicada broods that are in the ground. And they go into the ground for years. And then they come out and there's a cycle to it. And um, these groups of cicadas are called broods. And let me show you uh, this article here. Now that you see, you see the map, you see where they've, this map is from the article, which I'm about to show you. But here's the, an article that talks about this event. And th again, this is something occurring this year. And it's in that region. And so this article says billions of cicadas will emerge in the U.S. this year in a rare double brood event. This year's dual emergence is a rare synchronized event that last occurred in 1803. And let me read a little bit to you here. It says, with brood uh, 13 and brood uh, 19, I think it is, both set to pop out of the ground simultaneously, Illinois will be in a unique position to witness the once-in-a-lifetime emergence. The rare occurrence which occurred, uh, which could bring, sorry, which could bring billions, with a B, billions of cicadas to the surface, last happened 221 years ago. This year's dual emergence is a once-in-a-lifetime event. While any given 13-year brood and 17-year brood can occasionally emerge at the same time, each specific pair will see their cycles aligned only once every 221 years. What's more, this year's cicada groups, known as brood 13 and brood 19, happened to make their homes adjacent to one another with a narrow overlap in central Illinois. Thomas Jefferson was president the last time these two broods came out. So is it rare? Yes, said Jean Kritsky, an entomologist at Mount St. Joseph University in Cincinnati and author of A Tale of Two Broods, <laughs> a book about this year's dual emergence that was pu published earlier this month. So that's pretty interesting to me. Um, and um, let me just ask you guys, does it, do you think this type of thing gives off kind of a judgment plague kind of a vibe um these billions of cicadas coming out of a out of the ground in a very rare once in every 220 year event which happens to be right in that middle of the x interesting noteworthy again i'm not saying what it means i don't know if it means anything but it's interesting and i wanted to make you guys aware of it um all right Let's bring up the map of the eclipse again. And I want to talk about a few things here. Um, where is that map? Here we go. Let me bring this map up. And what, let's talk about prophetic, or at least possible. Let's talk about possible prophetic significance. Let's think out loud and consider these things together. So looking at this, looking at this happening and considering these things, the timing of this upcoming eclipse on April 8th, 2024, is very noteworthy. The timing is very noteworthy. The 2024 eclipse, which completes the X over America, is coming at a great time of prophetic convergence. I don't think anyone here tonight would um, would disagree that we are living in a time of great prophetic convergence. So this eclipse is coming at a time of great prophetic convergence. We are in, right now, we are in 
the final four window. It's what what we've termed it, the final four window. And I'm just referring to uh, something that Brother Pete Garcia and I have talked about, something that Brother Gary from unsealed.org uh, first brought up and got me thinking about. And it's basically this, the final four window is if you look at from the crucifixion to 2000 years after the crucifixion is when we would expect or it's logical to consider the second coming would be 2000 years after the crucifixion. And this is because of many scriptures and many references. And if you want to dive deeper into that, I encourage you to look up my video on the final four that I did with Brother Pete Garcia. Uh, go read the articles on unsealed.org about the final four. But the short version is it's pretty much agreed upon that the crucifixion was somewhere between 30 AD and 33 AD. So you have 30 AD, 31 AD, 32 AD, 33 AD. You got four years there. Uh, so you fast forward 2000 years from that to what could be considered possibly the second coming would be expected. And that would be uh, 2030, 2031, 2032, or 2033 for the second coming. So again, if it's, a, if it's the second coming, you would go back seven years prior from that second coming date to be looking for the rapture should happen somewhere at or before that time. So that would give you a final four range of 2023, 2024, 2025, or 2026. It's again, it's not something that I don't think anyone is dogmatic about or saying it has to be that way or it's for sure going to happen that way, but it's something very interesting and worth considering. And it's what we've just termed the final four window. So it is interesting that here we are in that final four window and all of these things are occurring. And this uh, eclipse is happening within this great time of prophetic convergence. Um. Let me see here. The time, this was interesting as well. The And I'm just going to list a bunch of, again, as we go, I'm just going to list more things that I find interesting for your consideration. The time from the 2017 eclipse to the 2024 eclipse is six years, six months, six weeks, and six days. And I saw that and I wasn't, I heard some people mention that. I wasn't sure if that was true. Um, I'm not the best at math, but my wife actually took it upon herself to do the math and she, she did. And let me share it with you because it actually works out. Um, so here's a picture of the math on a, on a post-it note that she gave me. So if you look at this, August 21st, 2017, that was the first eclipse going from the top down here. April 8th, 2024, that's the eclipse where, you know, it's upcoming, is six years, seven months, and 18 days, or 79 months, 346 weeks, or 2,423 days. So the question is, is that 2,423 days, can that be viewed as six years, six months, six weeks, and six days? And what she did is she took the date duration uh, website and looked at specifically the month, the months for the months there of March through October. And she worked out the math, including the two days for the two leap years. So that was 2,190 plus one day for the leap year, 183 plus one day for the leap year, plus 42 plus six equals 2,422 days. So that is depending on how you look at it, whether you count, you know, August, the day of the eclipse or not, that is six years, six months, six weeks, and six days. Is that significant? I don't know. But it's interesting that that is the time between the two eclipses, six, 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 four sixes. So make of it what you will. Um, another thing that's interesting, and this is again, this is another math thing, and um, I'm, I got a picture actually to show this. Where is this picture? Du, du, du. I made a picture for you. Hmm. Ah, there it is. So this is another 
interesting math thing having to do with the the dates someone just i think it was uh gary shared me shared this with me from unsealed so if you take the years 2017 and multiply it with 2024 you get 4082408 two, and so that's interesting because some people would look at that and see april 8th which is the date of the eclipse in 2024 4 8 24. and then of course you've got that extra 0 8 there at the end you know does that mean anything does multiplying these two things together mean anything i don't know i am not claiming that it does at all um just bringing it forward for your consideration for you to pray about for you to go to the lord about but it's interesting it definitely is interesting and i'm sure some of you guys are by now playing a game of every time i say interesting you do <laughs> you do something um go right ahead so let's see here all right so yeah let's talk about this this eclipse the timing again this is a, another timing thing to consider this eclipse this upcoming eclipse is coming at a time when the outlook for america is very bleak it's not looking good folks uh it's an election year we all know the craziness that has to do with our elections who's running this country it's it's basically the emperor has no clothes kind of situation here in america right now um we are pressuring israel to divide their land for a two-state solution excuse me for a two-state solution and we know that that is not something the lord takes lightly and i want to i want to show you this too this is um uh, i saw this posted by uh, a, a guy that I follow named Sean Ryan. He's a former U.S. Navy SEAL, uh, CIA intelligence officer, and has now become a believer in Jesus Christ. Praise God, because I, I was actually praying for him for years prior to him even becoming a believer. And it's awesome to see him now being a believer in Jesus Christ. But Sean Ryan has a great uh, YouTube channel where he talks to other veterans and other just incredible, interesting people about a variety of topics. But he posted this on, I think it was his Instagram. And I wanted to read it because I thought it was interesting coming from someone like him who has a lot of experience with the government and geopolitics and things like that. He said, it's becoming blatantly obvious that America is falling apart. The signs are everywhere you look. From our southern border to public schools, the division, our spending, all the wars we continue to fund, BRICS, the power grid, cyber attacks, funding the Taliban, politicians dying in office, U.S. is the number one consumer of child P-O-R-N, uh, the Epstein scandal, our president's declining mental state, our, in our inability to hold the corrupt accountable, weaponization of doj and federal agencies spy balloons traversing the entire continental united states and bridges being taken out at ports which could create an economic crisis and we're going to mention that bridge thing here in a little bit the decline in our military inflation destruction of the middle class and i know there is more so <clears throat> i thought that was pretty interesting perspective coming from sean ryan uh regarding the state that our country is in and I know for someone like him who has, you know, spilt blood, sweat, and tears and had loved ones and friends die uh, in the service of this country, it's hard for someone like Sean to see these things happening with our nation, to see our, um, our nation in decline and, and drastically so. Um, so we another thing to mention here is America. We just recently on March 25th, a few days ago, basically turned our backs on Israel. And we decided we're, we're not going to support them in the way that we were, which is, again, something that the Lord does not take lightly. The, the Bible says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Speaking of Israel. And I want to show you this article. This is from regarding what happened a few days ago. Uh, oops, if you don't know, let me bring this up. This was what I'm referring to here. So 
the United States failed to veto the ceasefire resolution um, at the UN. We abstained, we declined. We, we did not use our veto power to come to the aid or to stand up for Israel. And so Israel has been very offended and hurt by this. And Israel, the title says, Israel cancels Washington visit after U.S. allows U.N. Gaza ceasefire resolution to pass. So we're essentially not standing up for them and not being the ally that we should be for our ally, Israel. And this is kind of a stab in the back to Israel. And it's, it's very noteworthy. Again, in this time that we're living in, of great prophetic convergence, of, of decline of our nation, to be turning our back in a way on Israel is not a good thing. It's not a good sign. And what's also interesting is that <clears throat> right after the, I mean, 1.30 a.m. the next day, so basically that night, that happened on March 25th when we turned our backs and didn't stand up for them. That night or 1.30 a.m. the next day, whichever way you want to look at it, the Francis Scott Key Bridge was hit by a ship and completely collapsed. And that bridge is a very, it's like, I think it's one of the top five vital roadways for the transportation of like oil and gas and very critical, it's a very critical infrastructure bridge. And it's a big deal. It's a big setback that it was taken down. It was completely collapsed. Let me show you an article on that. Um, in case you weren't aware maybe that this happened just the other day, right after we turned our backs on Israel. Is there a connection there? I don't know. Is it possible that it's connected? It's possible. But here's the article. It says the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore collapses six feared dead. <clears throat> so also there's a video, uh, and I'm going to show you guys that actually. There's a video of the um of the bridge being hit so here's the video here for you guys to see i'll make it full screen so you can see it better and again you be the judge is this is this something you see the we're on the other side of the bridge there's a ship coming towards the bridge it hits the main post there and the whole bridge collapses again this is a very vital vital bridge so you decide is it, do you think that this is something that's basically a judgment on our nation i'm not i'm not saying either way i'm just presenting this stuff to to be considered but it's very sad to see and i think we should be praying for those people um affected by that tragedy because it's terrible but i think many people would look at these type of things like sean ryan was just talking about and see the writing on the wall and Another thing I find interesting about this is the name of the bridge, Francis Scott Key Bridge. <clears throat> well, Francis Scott Key is the one who wrote our national anthem, the, 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 the Star Spangled Banner. You know, oh, say, can you see the Star Spangled Banner yet wave? Oh, the land of the free and the home of the brave. That's pretty interesting. So could it be that the collapse of this bridge is a sign of the coming collapse of the land of the free and the home of the brave. I don't know. I do not know. It's noteworthy and it's worth considering. You take it to the Lord. You pray and see what God speaks to you, how God leads you. But very interesting stuff. Now, another thing that's happening also at this time and, and, um, by the way, I think I forgot to mention, but let me rewind and hit it because I, I did think I, I do think I forgot regarding that massive cicada brood that's going to, you know, the double brood that's going to come out um, this year right in the middle of that X. That's happening in April. It's not on the day of the eclipse, but it is in the same month. It is happening in April when those cicadas come out for whatever reason that just popped into my mind. But another thing that's that's going on in the midst of all of this 
is uh, this. Let me bring this article up because this is worth paying attention to. This is pretty serious stuff. This is a Jerusalem Post article. It says the Ramadan powder keg, the Temple Mount in the eye of the storm. And this is this is a big deal because the Temple Mount is a powder keg right now. What with the war in Israel, uh, Ramadan going on, and the red heifers, which are being readied to sacrifice in the hopes for the preparation of the third Jewish temple. And we talked, I just did a video, an entire video, going over the, the whole red heifer thing in Israel's third temple in detail, if you'd like to watch that. But there was a clip shown on the news of uh, one of the terrorists citing the red heifers as one of the reasons for the October 7th attack. And the the terrorists and the I guess the, the Muslims see the red heifer as a threat to the Temple Mount because it's the Jews trying to prepare for a third temple. And so this is one of the reasons it's being put forth that the um, <clears throat> terrorist organizations are calling it the Al-Aqsa flood. And they're kind of focusing this the fight terminology around the Temple Mount. And not only that, the, the Israeli soldiers are focused on the Temple Mount. And they've got patches showing the third temple on some of their uniforms. So this is all creating a very, very volatile situation right now. And uh, we're also in the middle of Ramadan right now, which is the Muslim fast. Uh, and it's a, it's usually or historically a very tumultuous time between the Jews and the Arabs, the Muslims. And um, what's what's interesting as well here to note is that Ramadan, the Muslim fast, Ramadan ends on April 9th, which is the day after the eclipse. And so with Ramadan going, with all of these things happening, there's a lot of focus on this area of the world, on the Temple Mount specifically. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard it said that if you want to know what time it is on the prophetic time clock, look at Israel. And that, you know, Israel is the hour hand, uh, Jerusalem is the minute hand, and the Temple Mount is the second hand of God's prophetic clock. So there's a lot of focus on the Temple Mount right now. And it's interesting that the last day or towards the end of Ramadan um, is usually seen as a as a very precarious time. And that happens to be the day after the date of the eclipse, which would be April 9th, 2024. Now, let me get rid of this uh, slide. Speaking of Israel being threatened and the sun and the moon and things like that, I thought some of these some some scripture verses came to mind and I wanted to read these with you guys really quick because it I found it interesting. Um, Jeremiah 31 35 through 36. It says, "Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night." So we have the sun and the moon being mentioned. "Who stirs up the sea that its waves roar?" So keep those three things in mind, the sun and the moon, sun and the moon, and the sea and the waves roaring. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. So right there, God is saying the existence of the nation of Israel is a big deal to me. In fact, it's going to exist as long as you see there's a sun and a moon and the, the the fixed order that God has determined for those. As long as the sun is rising and the moon is rising, God says there's going to be an Israel. And he says, then as, if this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. That's pretty serious. But I find it interesting that it mentions the sun and the moon and the seas roaring. Let's look at 
<clears throat> another passage of scripture, this time in the New Testament, in Luke 21, 25 through 28. In fact, let me, I think I have a of this verse. I can bring it up and you guys can look at it with me while we're reading it here. Let's see. Where did I have that verse? Yeah, here we go. Let me bring this verse up so you guys can see it. There. All right. So Luke 21, 25 through 28. And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and stars and on the earth, the stress of nations and perplexity because the roaring of the sea and the waves. That's really interesting. That's exactly the same three things mentioned in Jeremiah. Sun and the moon and the stars and the sea and the waves roaring. Same three things. Again, and there will be signs in the sun and the moon and stars and on the earth distress of nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. People fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. So one thing that's important to understand or to look at here is this verse, verse 28, at least I believe, is referring to the rapture. Verse 28, I believe, is referring to the rapture. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. I believe that's speaking about the day of redemption, which Paul preached about, which is the rapture. And it's notice it doesn't say when these things have already happened, when these things are in the already happening. It says when they begin to take place. Look up because your redemption is drawing near. What things? Well, signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, the waves roaring, people distressing and in perplexity because of what's happening or what's coming upon the world. And it says after those things, in verse 27, notice where it says, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. That's speaking about the second coming. So after all of those things, and again, I think there's a almost a dual nature to this. When they begin to happen, what begins to happen? Signs in the sun, in the moon, and the stars, distress of nations, the, the sea and the wars, ra- uh, the waves w- roaring, those things beginning to happen. We're seeing those things begin to happen prior to the tribulation period. But they're also, I believe, referring to things that happen right before the second coming as well. And the Bible talks about the sun being turned to darkness and the moon being turned to blood right before the actual second coming. But again, when we look at verse 28, I think we're talking about the rapture when these things begin to take place. And I think we can look around the world and see that the things that are going to happen or find their complete fulfillment during the tribulation period, the seven year tribulation period are beginning. The the preparation for that seven year tribulation period is happening now before our eyes. We can see how there's going to be a one world order. We can see how there's going to be a mark of the beast. We can see that the decline of America, we can see all these things beginning. So when we look at verse 28, I think it is, I think we are in that time of these things beginning to happen. And I think it's time to look up. And I think it's noteworthy that it mentions signs in the sun and the moon. And is it possible what we're looking at is seeing those things begin to happen? I don't know. I'm not saying either way. I'm not here to prove either way. I'm just bringing it up and you Go to the word, go to the Lord in prayer, and seek the Holy Spirit's guidance. Um, another verse is Joel 28 through 32, which, which is <clears throat> also relevant to these scriptures that we just read. Let me read you Joel 28 through 32. It says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. When did that happen? Pentecost. That's when the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. And remember, this 
this was brought up, this was quoted by Peter in Acts chapter 2. He quoted this verse, Joel 2. So this is referring to something that has already begun to happen. Okay, but listen, let's read further. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. <clears throat> the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be those who escape. As the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall but shall be those whom the Lord calls. So that's speaking of Pentecost, we know. And uh, Peter quoted this at Pentecost when he came out filled with the Holy Spirit from the upper room. But it talks about before the awesome day of the Lord comes, there'll be signs in the sun and the moon, and specifically the sun being turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Some people wonder if that is referring to solar eclipses and blood moons. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not able to say either way. Uh, but I think it is possible that scripture is pointing to this as something that happens both prior to the day of the Lord being the seven year tribulation period and prior to the singular day of the Lord being the second coming day when Jesus comes back at the end of the seven year tribulation period. So these are things to just take to mind, to be considering and praying about. Now, let's talk about, do we see judgment coming upon America? Let's talk about America and the end times regarding scripture um and and actually here's something i want to bring up uh having to do with this specific thing this is another reason why the nar or the new apostolic reformation the seven mountain mandate the whatever you want to call it it has a bunch of different names this is another reason why it's false and they do not line up with scripture they are false prophets and false teachers. Uh, the, the NAR, New Apostolic Seven Mountain Mandate movement, full of all these fake prophets, say that we have to make America great again. We have to rescue America and we need to rescue the world. And they supposedly prophesy that the future is bright. The future is bright and we simply need to exert our influence more in politics, in economics, in education, in culture. And then we, notice it's a very inward focused thing, then we will turn the world into a bright conservative utopia and we will do all the work for God and we will lay the red carpet out and then God will come back. That sounds nice, and it's it's even seductive to someone who's conservative and Christian to hear smooth words and prophecies like that. The only problem is it doesn't line up with Scripture. It doesn't line up with what the Bible says about the end times, about the last days. Uh, when we look at Scripture... We see no influential America in the last days. In fact, we see a very obvious, very conspicuous absence of America, which is the current world superpower. We see a very conspicuous absence of America in the last days prophecies. Why? Why is that? Well, you know, where did it go? because we don't we don't see it there here i'm just gonna share with you my personal perspective and 
again, take everything everyone says for yourself to scripture and to God. But here's, I just want to share you my perspective. I personally suspect that America is mystery Babylon. Currently, I believe we are on the current seat of the world system. So when you look at Revelation 17 and Revelation 18, it shows this whore which sits on this seven-headed beast, which represents the world power, the world system, the world kingdom. I believe America is currently the one who sits on the beast. And the Bible says that there's going to be 10 kings that rise up that hate that one that sits on the beast, and they will attack her and burn her with fire and destroy her. Then they will get the power for a short time, and then they will hand their power and authority over to the Antichrist, the beast. And he will be the evil antichrist dictator on the earth. And <clears throat> I believe that America best fits the description in Revelation 18 of this one who sits on the seat of authority or control over the world and power over the world. And I believe it shows a coming destruction. Uh, in fact, and this, again, this may not be a mainstream uh, opinion or perspective, but I'm just sharing with you my personal perspective. When I look at Revelation 18, verse 4, I suspect that it might be a, a rapture passage, a rapture verse, because understand that Revelation is not straight chron chronological. Uh, it doesn't just follow one chapter to the next in a straight chronological timeline. It zooms in and zooms out multiple times in the book of Revelation. But Revelation 18, 4 says, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues. And to me, that makes me think of the rapture because there's a voice from heaven calling his people out of a place that's about to be destroyed. That very much sounds like rapture to me. In fact, it reminds me of another scripture, which is Isaiah 28, oh, sorry, Isaiah 26. And I'm going to start in verse uh, 19. It says in Isaiah 26, 19, Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body, shall they arise. Awake and sing ye that dwell in the dust for the dew for thy dew is as the dew of herbs and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come my people. This sounds very much like Revelation 18 4 to me. Come my people. Enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. So when I read it, Revelation 18, 4, that passage in Isaiah definitely comes to mind. And when we look at does America fit the description listed in Revelation 18, personally, I don't see how it could be talking about any other nation. And let me read a few verses here for you. Revelation 18, verse 8. Speaking of the, the one who's sitting on the beast who is destroyed, it's, it, which is representative of a place. It says, therefore shall her plague come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. So God's bringing his people out of a place by his voice before a destruction. And this is, it's going to be destroyed in a day, it says, and burned with fire specifically. Uh, Revelation 18, 9 through 11. Again, look at this and you tell me if you think this sounds like America. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, 
for in one hour is thy judgment come and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. <clears throat> now, personally, when I look at this, I can't help but see America. There is no other nation that fits this description of all the merchants and all the rulers of the world mourning that it's gone, of all the merchants growing rich because of her. If this is to apply to any other nation, I would say we probably have we're probably 100, 200, maybe maybe 100 or 200 years away from this being able to apply to another nation, from all the merchants of the earth growing rich because of one nation and, and buying things and selling things because of this one nation. I think it applies to America. I see America personally when I look at it. So let's do some overview. Let's just do some, some recap. Are these eclipses that the 2017 and the 2024 upcoming one, are these eclipses a sign of coming judgment on America? They form an X over America. The center of the X is right over the New Madrid fault zone. We've got the cicada brood coming. We've got the lines of the both eclipses lining up with the Florida, whatever alignment gravity fault zone, which is identical to the line of this 2017 and 2024 eclipses. Um, we've got all these prophetic convergence. We've got this state of decline of America. It's, it's too many things to keep really in your mind at one time, but there's a lot of things to consider. And again, we just ask ourselves this question because we're, we're not here to prove whether it is a sign or it's not. We're here to ask questions, consider things thoughtfully, to look at scripture, to consider that, to pray, take these things to the Lord, and above all, look to God and follow the Holy Spirit's guidance. But are these things, are these eclipses specifically, a sign of coming judgment on, on America? Maybe not. Maybe not. I don't know for sure. Or maybe they are. Maybe they are. We simply take all these things into consideration. Um, and I just want to say this. Remember this. For those who are in Christ Jesus, we are at peace. No matter what, no matter what comes, we are at peace. Because we do not hope in this world and we do not hope even in this nation our hope is in jesus christ and in jesus christ alone first corinthians 5 19 through 23 says if in this life only we have hope in christ if if in this life only we have hope in christ we are of all men most miserable but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man cometh death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. We are at peace. We know him who has eternal life. We know where we're going. We know whose hands we are in. Our hope rests firmly in Jesus. And it doesn't matter if what comes. It doesn't matter if judgment comes to this nation. It doesn't matter if uh, this eclipse comes and goes and nothing happens that day. It doesn't matter. Our hope's not in some eclipse or some date, our hope is in Jesus. Now, let's let's consider this too. If this eclipse happens on April 8th and comes and goes and nothing happens that day, does that mean it wasn't a sign? I don't know. Not necessarily. I mean, I I would think a lot of times when you look at a sign, let's let's use like a travel analogy. You know, if you're traveling and you see a sign, 
usually it's pointing to something ahead. So how long do you wait after a sign to know whether or not it related to the sign? I don't know. I have more questions than answers, but it's something to think about. Um, I would think that there would have to be some type of proximity relative to the sign enough that you could say, okay, there's a, there's a logical or at least a reasonable connection. We'll see. All we can do is wait and see. My point is our faith is in Jesus and, and not in a sign. We don't need a sign. We need a savior. We need Jesus Christ. Uh, and this is the most important thing. This is the most important thing that we can talk about is the good news, the gospel, Jesus. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. We are all sinful. We all need a savior. And praise God, there is a savior and his name is Jesus Christ. And Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And then John 3, 16 through 18 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Please place your faith in Jesus Christ. Whatever is happening here, whether it's a sign, whether it's not, we should be able to look around and see the signs are everywhere. Whether you want to consider this eclipse a sign or not, the signs are everywhere. These are the last days. Jesus is coming soon. Judgment is coming soon. And none of us know if we have another second or another day to live. So let's use this opportunity as a time to wake up, turn to the Lord, and preach the good news to all those around us. Point people to Jesus because he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. So guys, I pray this was informational and a blessing and encouraging to you guys. And again, I just ask that you consider all of these things for yourself, that you go to the word of God, that you pray, that you look to the Holy Spirit for your guidance and not to men. All right, God bless you guys. I love you. And I have another video coming up soon. I'm gonna be talking about some things uh, uh, that are happening later in 2024 that I find very, very interesting that I wanna bring up for your consideration as well. And um, I also have some other topics on my heart regarding uh, the rapture and being changed into our glorified bodies that I want to um, share and and talk about as well. Look at the scripture about and um, be encouraged about. And listen, guys, we're we're being obedient to scripture. Scripture says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. It says, do not uh, cease to gather together but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So that's what we're doing. That's why we're getting together and talking about these things is to encourage each other, the body of Christ, and to point the lost to Jesus Christ. So let's continue to do that in faithfulness and in service to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right. God bless you guys. I love you until I see you next time. May the Lord bless you and keep you and good night.